In just one decade, the number of people with diabetes has more than doubled. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, by 2050, one out of every three of us may have diabetes. What's the big deal? Well, the consequences of diabetes are legion. The number one cause of adult onset blindness, the number one cause of kidney failure, the number one cause of surgical amputations. What can we do to prevent it? Well, the onset of type 2 diabetes is gradual, with most individuals progressing through a state of prediabetes, a condition now striking approximately 1 in 3 Americans. But only about 1 in 10 even knows it. Since current methods of treating diabetes remain inadequate, prevention is preferable, but what works better, lifestyle changes or drugs? We didn't know until this landmark study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Thousands were randomized to get a good double dose of the leading anti-diabetes drug or diet and exercise. The drug, metformin, is probably the safest diabetes drug there is. Um, does cause diarrhea, and about half of those who take it makes one in four nauseous. About one in ten suffer from asthenia, uh, from the Greek meaning lack of strength, uh, causing physical weakness and fatigue. Uh, but the risk of being killed by the drug is only about 1 in 66,000 every year. And the drug worked. Compared to placebo, in terms of the percentage of people developing diabetes within the four-year study period, fewer people in the drug group developed diabetes. But diet and exercise alone worked better. The lifestyle intervention reduced diabetes incidence by 58%, compared to only 31% with the drug. The lifestyle intervention was significantly more effective than the drug and had fewer side effects. More than three-quarters of those on the drug reported gastrointestinal symptoms, though there was more muscle soreness reported in the lifestyle group on account they were actually exercising. Other studies subsequently found the same result. Non-drug approaches, superior to drug-based approaches for diabetes prevention. And the 50% or so drop in risk was not for people that actually improved their diet and lifestyle, but just those instructed to improve their diet and lifestyle, whether or not they actually did it. Check this out. This is one of the most famous diabetes prevention studies. 500 people with prediabetes randomized into a lifestyle intervention or control group. And during the trial, the risk of diabetes was reduced by that same 50 to 60%. But only a fraction of the patients met the modest goals. Right? Even in the lifestyle intervention group, only about a quarter were able to eat enough fiber, meaning whole plant foods, and cut down on enough saturated fat, which in this country is mostly dairy, dessert, chicken, and pork. But they did better than the control group, and fewer of them developed diabetes because of it. But what if you looked just at the folks that actually made the lifestyle changes, met at least four out of five of those wimpy goals? They had zero diabetes. None of them got diabetes, 100% drop in risk. Bottom line, type 2 diabetes can be prevented by changes in lifestyle, even in high-risk prediabetic subjects. The fact, then, that type 2 diabetes, a largely preventable disorder, has reached such epidemic proportion is a public health humiliation. After about age 20, we may have all the insulin-producing beta cells we're ever going to have in our pancreas, and so if we lose them, we may lose them for good. Autopsy studies show that by the time type 2 diabetes is diagnosed, we may have already killed off half of our beta cells. You can do it right in a petri dish. Expose human beta cells to fat, they suck it up, and then start dying off. A chronic increase in blood fat levels is harmful, as shown by the important effects in pancreatic beta cell lipotoxicity. Fat breakdown products can interfere with the function of these cells and ultimately lead 
to their death, and not just any fat, saturated fat. The predominant fat in olives, nuts, and avocados gives you a tiny bump in death protein 5, but saturated fat really ramps up this contributor to beta cell death. Saturated fats are harmful to beta cells, harmful to the insulin-producing cells in our pancreas. Cholesterol too. The uptake of bad cholesterol, LDL, can cause beta cell death as a result of free radical formation. So, Diets rich in saturated fats not only cause obesity and insulin resistance, but the increased levels of circulating free fats in the blood, called NEFAs, non-esterified uh, non fatty acids, causes beta cell death, and may thus contribute to progressive beta cell loss in type 2 diabetes. And this isn't just based on test tube studies. If you infuse fat into people's bloodstream, you can directly impair pancreatic beta cell function, and the same when we ingest it. Type 2 diabetes is characterized by defects in both insulin secretion and insulin action, and saturated fat appears to impair both. Researchers showed saturated fat ingestion reduces insulin sensitivity within hours, but these were non-diabetic, so their pancreas should have been able to boost insulin secretion to match, but insulin secretion failed to compensate for insulin resistance in subjects who ingested the saturated fat and this implies the saturated fat impaired beta cell function as well, again just within hours after going into our mouth. So increased consumption of saturated fats has a powerful short and long-term effect on insulin action, contributing to the dysfunction and death of pancreatic beta cells in diabetes. And saturated fat isn't just toxic to the pancreas. The fats found predominantly in meat and dairy— uh, chicken and cheese are the two main sources of the American diet— are almost universally toxic, whereas the fats found in olive nuts and avocados are not. Saturated fat has been found to be particularly toxic to liver cells in the formation of fatty liver disease. You expose human liver cells to plant fat, and nothing happens. Expose liver cells to animal fat, and a third of them die. This may explain why higher intakes of saturated fat and cholesterol are associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. By cutting down on saturated fat consumption, we may be able to help interrupt this process. Decreasing saturated fat intake may help bring down the need for all that excess insulin. So either being fat or eating saturated fat can both cause that excess insulin in the blood. The effect of reducing dietary saturated fat intake on insulin levels is substantial. Uh, regardless of how much belly fat we have. And it's not just that by eating fat we may be more likely to store it as fat. Saturated fats, independently of any role they have of making us fat, may contribute to the development of insulin resistance and all its clinical consequences. After controlling for weight and alcohol and smoking and exercise and family history, diabetes incidence was significantly associated with the proportion of saturated fat in our blood. So what causes diabetes? The consumption of too many calories rich in saturated fats. Now, just like everyone who smokes doesn't develop lung cancer, everyone that eats a lot of saturated fat doesn't develop diabetes. There's a genetic component. But just like smoking can be said to cause lung cancer, high-calorie diets rich in saturated fats is currently considered the cause of type 2 diabetes.